So to start the message this morning, I want to give some background information so that we'll all understand where it has come from. Several weeks ago, the elders of Forge Road Bible Chapel distributed a letter to the congregation discussing work we had done studying women's roles in the church and su suggesting some additions to our practices we felt were acceptable and appropriate at this time in our church's history. We were having a congregational meeting, as Matt said, on Sunday, September 27th, to discuss the specifics of the letter, so I do not plan to spend time today on those specifics. Rather, my goal is to give you a sense of how we, the elders, got to the point of authoring the letter and then give an overall bird's eye view of my understanding of the verses dealing with this topic. The elders asked the congregation for input regarding the proposals offered in the letter and have received much. One question that has been asked is, why now? Or what prompted the elders to suggest these things at this time? The short answer to this question is, why not now? As elders, we have the responsibility to study the Bible together and consider what it says about how our church should function and what practices we incorporate into that functioning. The woman's role in the church life is certainly an important topic in the Bible, and it is something we as elders should study together and then review our current practices based on that study. We strive to evaluate everything we do as a church, through the lens of the Bible. Our desire is to be a sound, biblically-based group of believers that honors God by our obedience to His Word. Over the last several years, it has been suggested by some within the elders group that we commit time to study to the study of this topic. For many years now, we have been meeting annually for an all-day elders retreat, and this past November we committed time at this retreat to the topic of women's roles within the church. We then committed to study it further individually and together during our weekly elders meetings as our schedule allowed. Of course, COVID-19 interrupted our work on this topic, but we eventually came back to it, and the letter is the result of our study together. Women's roles was not something the current group of elders had committed time to study together, and it was good and right to do so. Our guiding questions were, what does the Bible teach about this issue? How do our current church practices regarding this issue reflect what we believe the Bible teaches about it, and what new practices might we be able to incorporate into our current practices that would encourage the body while still submitting to the authority of Scripture? As most of you know, I am a born and raised Forge Road Bible Chapel member. I'm 54 years old and have been going to church here 55 years. <laughs> I think I've used that line before in a message, too. <clears throat> As such... I am influenced by the Plymouth Brethren Assembly history concerning biblical doctrines. Throughout my life, I have read and studied the verses pertaining to women's roles, but I also assumed that those who came before me had figured out correctly biblically-based practices, and so the way we did things was right and in no need of question or change. This history influences the lens through which I view Scripture. The older I get, the more I appreciate that some of what churches do is simply a function of someone in the past deciding it is the way we should do it, and sometimes as much for practical reasons as biblical. The danger is when these practices become such a habit for us that we assume it is the biblical and godly way of doing it, that to change would be somehow rebelling against God's commands for the church. Believe me. The elders did not make the suggestions we did just to stir up, stir the pot and cause trouble. We desire unity and edification of the body. The easy thing to do would be to just leave things as they are. But this is not always the healthiest choice for a church. We, as elders, and I'm sure some of you have as well, observed a critical problem that many churches like ours have. 
when they get stuck in their church practices and do not allow for biblical consideration of change in those practices where it may be appropriate. They are literally dying of old age. Many assemblies have closed down simply because they refused to consider change to their practices when meeting as a church. God has given his church a lot of freedom when it comes to how we fellowship together and some of what we do is based as much on our church culture and traditional practices as it is the Bible. Don't get me wrong. We are a Bible-believing, teaching, studying church. And if it is clear that God has called us to some practice within our church body, we want to do it. But we also should be willing to honestly study the scriptures and see if there are things we can do differently and still obey the Lord, being faithful to his word. An example of this concept. I think of musical instruments during our singing time. I am old enough to remember when the only appropriate instruments to use while singing in church were the piano and organ. To allow an electric guitar or, heaven forbid, drums to be used would be like using the tools of Satan in our church and to be driven by culture. I remember hearing conversations from older believers about this issue as a young man where phrases like tools of the devil were used. And Bible verses were used to defend their arguments. But something didn't seem right to me. As it turns out, the Bible in Psalms and other places speaks of people using stringed instruments and percussion to worship God and music. Woo! Allowing more instruments to be used during our singing time has many benefits, with the best being the use of gift by many more brothers and sisters in the church, which seems to, be, seems to me to be the most important overriding spiritual principle, the priesthood of all believers, the use of gift in the church. I am grateful, then, I'm grateful that when, as a young believer at then Hillendale Bible Chapel, I went to the elders and they listened to my request to bring some of the updated Christian songs I was learning at Christian camp back to church. And, as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> Certainly, there are limits to what we can and should do during the singing time, but there are also freedom to do things we may not currently be doing. I want to clearly set at this point that the elders of Forge Road Bible Chapel greatly value, appreciate, and love the women of our church. Clearly, the female members of FRBC are critical to the life and vitality of it. We recognize that this body of believers would not function as it does without the dedicated and faithful work of our women members. Thank you. We greatly appreciate the biblical attitude you strive for as you serve. I admit that I have spent more time over the last six months studying the topic of women's roles in the church than all the time I spent studying it the rest of my life. I found the study personally satisfying, encouraging, challenging, frustrating, and good. The relationship between men and women and how they function together is not an easy topic. It is no wonder that in Ephesians 5.32, Paul calls the husband-wife relationship a great mystery. <laughs> the elders believe it has been worth the work to consider what the Bible says about women's roles in the church and to evaluate what participation opportunities we are free to incorporate into our church practices. Why did I choose to speak on this topic today? Well, I felt it might be helpful to share some information with our members about the process and study that, we went, that went into the letter before the upcoming congregational meeting. I also felt the Lord asking me to take on this topic from the pulpit because of the unique opportunity he afforded me to study it with a special group of people. Let me explain. <clears throat> we, the elders, were studying this topic, and it became obvious that we needed to get input from the women of FRBC. Duh. <laughs> 
We did this by asking several women across age ranges and backgrounds to give their input. I personally felt a burden to get some face-to-face -face feedback from women of FRBC. It eventually occurred to me that I had access to a representative group of women from Forge Road Bible Chapel who could help me in my study of this topic, and they were all stuck with me at home due to COVID-19. <laughs> On my own, I decided to ask Lois Dunkard and my mom, Beth Dunkard and my wife, and Abby and Hannah Dunkard and my daughters to do a regular study with me about this topic where we would consider the important verses that speak to this issue. It was not easy. There were some tears shed and frustration. And we still do not all agree on what the best interpretation and application of every aspect of the verses related to this topic are. Often, I talk too much and didn't listen enough. But in the end, it was a profitable exercise. I trust it helped them in their understanding of the challenging issues around the topic. I know it helped me, and I thank them for their willingness to do it with me and for me. I hope this opening gives you some sense of the work the elders did before authoring the letter and that it answers questions concerning its history. Just a few more comments before we get to the passages that deal with women's roles in the public church setting. Let me first acknowledge that a discussion of this topic can turn negative because the verbiage used in the discussion and the cultural influences on our language may give the impression that the Bible is advocating for male superiority and domination over women. It does not. Satan has been actively twisting the terms used in the discussion to give this impression. I also acknowledge the very real history of some men using scriptures to justify abuse of women. This is sin. My goal is always to seek the Holy Spirit's help to correctly understand the Bible and live by and interact with others based on that understanding. There are many verses that speak of the gender roles in the marriage relationship that parallel the verses concerning gender roles within the congregation. But we do not have time to consider those today. I trust it is obvious that I will not even approach exhausting this topic. But I hope that what I share today will generate more biblically-based, positive conversations about this issue in our church body and lay some groundwork for our upcoming congregational meeting. Husbands and wives, talk about these things at home. Brothers and sisters in Christ, talk about these issues in small groups and with your friends. As you feel led, please talk with the elders about this topic. We want us all unified and edified as we move forward in this discussion and in the practices that come out of it. Let's get to some of the verses concerning women's roles in the church. The first passage that I want to look at is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul here is giving instruction to the Christians in Corinth, and he writes this. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. I praise you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Following these verses, in verses 14 to 16, Paul discusses instructions concerning head coverings for men and women. That instruction is given as a physical representation of the spiritual principle given in verse 3. In verses 1 and 2, Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to continue living as Christians should live, following the instructions they already knew. Verse 3 begins with, but, but I want you to know. It is as if Paul is saying there is something even more important that they need to know to be Christians that God calls them to be. Verse 3 is so full of doctrine, we could spend several messages unpacking it. For today, I want to focus most of our attention on the part that is pertinent to our discussion. God is a God of relationship. And this verse is about roles within relationships. The key word in this verse is head. What does it mean in the context of these verses? It seems clearly defined from the verse itself based on what we know of the relationship described. 
The term describes rank or authority within the relationship. We understand from experience and from Scripture, see 1 Corinthians 12, that a human body needs all parts functioning to be complete. But each part plays its own role in the healthy function of it. The role of the head is to do what? To make decisions for the rest of the body that the body follows. My hand can't move unless it gets instruction from my head. This role does not make the head more important than any other part. It is just playing its God-given role for the body. We use the term headship to describe these relationships seen in this verse. This concept is discussed elsewhere in Scripture, so the principle of headship is extremely important. It makes sense to us that Christ is the head of every man. The phrase means what it says. Every human male is under the authority of Christ. Does that sound right to you? Every human male is under the authority of Christ. Is that what we see in our world today? No. So how is this true? Is it true that it is true that some men choose to submit themselves to the authority of Christ, but some willfully reject Christ's headship? So how is this verse tr true? What does the Bible tell us? Whoops. Whoops. My there we go. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whether they choose to or not, every created thing will one day acknowledge Jesus as head. Given the order of headship in this verse, both men and women are under the headship of Christ, and so we all together will rightly bow before him one day. Amen? Amen. Another amazing truth in this verse is that Christ, men and women, are all under the headship of God. The Trinity is an amazing relationship. Somehow, Jesus is God, in all ways he is God, and yet existing in submission to the will of the Father. Jesus professes this truth himself. In John 6, 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus Christ, God of all creation and of heaven, makes the choice to be in submission to God the Father. This is an amazing and wonderful truth, which we do not have time to consider more fully today, but I encourage you to study the relationships in the Godhead as presented in Scripture. It is both informative about the nature of God and encouraging. <coughs> Excuse me. Obviously, our purpose is to consider what it means in this verse that the man is the head of a woman. Let me briefly note that some of your translations may read something to the effect of the head of a wife is her husband. This is a possible translation of the original language, but given the context of this phrase within the verses around it, a majority of scholars agree that the best translation is the man is the head of a woman. Paul is speaking of relationships. And in verses 1 to 16, there is a focus on the relationship between men and women in marriage and the church. Paul is teaching that God, since the creation of people, has designed the relationship between men and women such that the man has positional authority, headship, with respect to the woman in marriage and the church. Didn't we just learn last week that the male and female are equal before Christ? In his message, Kyle referenced Galatians 3.28, which says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote this too, so is he contradicting himself? This is challenging to understand, but just as Jesus can be in all ways equal with God and yet him submit himself to the headship of the Father, so too women can be spiritually equal with men and yet still choose to submit to the headship of men. Galatians 3 is speaking about spiritual equality between all peoples. We are all sinners in need of salvation. And that salvation is available to every human being, regardless of their physical characteristics or circumstances. Praise the Lord. 
Our verse from 1 Corinthians are speaking about relationships within the church community and how God has designed the relationships within that spiritual community to function. I know this can be difficult to understand. Certainly our culture fights against what is taught here, and I believe the Bible gives explanation for that difficulty in Genesis 3, but we do not have time to go there today. I think it's the third time I've said that. I apologize. You have a lot of work to do on your own. It is important to note that this principle of headship is not something that originated within the time and culture Paul was writing in. Paul makes the point himself that the relationship principles being taught here are part of God's design. In verses 8 and 9, Paul references the creation account as his justification for the headship principle. He says this, For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for man. Headship was designed by God before sin entered the world and before culture could influence human thinking. It is true that Paul also speaks of the equality of men and women in verses 11 and 12, and so both things must be true. Again, the Bible never advances the idea that everyone is equal in every way. To say that everyone is equal in every way is obviously untrue. What does it teach? What it does teach is spiritual equality before God. Within the church, there is spiritual equality among its members, but differing roles concerning the functioning of the church. One thing we need to understand is that headship is not about status. Rather, it is about roles designed by God. To help us understand this, headship, uh, this idea of headship, I thought of an analogy that may help clarify what God, through Paul, is teaching us. The analogy is coming from me, a man, so please forgive me if it falls short of being as helpful as I think it is in explaining headship. I admit it's flawed. It involves NFL football. If nothing else, the timing of this analogy feels right given the first Ravens game of 2020 starts in the next few hours. Does anyone know who this is? Some are saying, yeah, that's Jonathan Ogden. Yep. Jonathan Ogden was the left tackle for the Baltimore Ravens for many seasons and won the Super Bowl with the Ravens. It was the 2000 season, 2001 Super Bowl. At that time, he was listed at six foot nine inches tall, weighing 345 pounds. This is a big, athletic, talented football player. He was the first Baltimore Raven inducted into the Hall of Fame and is considered one of the best offensive linemen ever to play the game of football. Now, quickly, whoops, I hit the wrong button again. Quickly, for those who don't know, here is a picture of the classic pre-snap football formation. The offensive line in football is the group of men who block the defensive line, providing running lanes for the running back and pass protection for the quarterbacks. Offensive line defense. So these guys are the protection for these guys back here. The left tackle, who is this guy right here, this big fella, not this guy, he's the tight end. This guy, the tackle, uh, is considered the premier offensive lineman position in football because this player protects the back of the quarterback, assuming the quarterback is right-handed, when he drops back to pass, right? When the quarterback drops back to pass, his blind side is available for a defenseman. The tackle on that side has to protect from the outside rush. Given the cost of most quarterbacks, left tackles tend to get paid a lot of money compared to, with other offensive linemen. Now, why do I bring up Jonathan Ogden in a discussion about women's roles? Does anyone know, shoot, does anyone know who this is? I had to look him up myself. This is Jeff Mitchell. He was the offensive center for the Ravens during that same Super Bowl season. The center is the one who starts every play by snapping the ball to the quarterback, in case you don't know. Why mention these two men? Jeff, am I over on that side? Because I'm not getting an answer. There we go. Why do I mention these two men? 
In professional football, there is something called offensive line schemes. They are blocking plans for the offensive line based on the offensive play called and the position of the defend defenders on the other side of the ball. The offensive play is usually called in the huddle, and then the offensive line makes its way to the line of scrimmage. That's where they were lined up at the beginning of the play. Someone from the line must call out the blocking scheme to the rest of the linemen. Jeff Mitchell was responsible for calling out the line schemes for the Baltimore Ravens during their Super Bowl season. In the NFL, the offensive line scheme is called by one of the interior linemen, not the tackles. The reason is simple. They can be heard the best. It makes sense, and is the way it is done in the NFL. Now, how do I see this as an analogy to help us understand headship? Even though Jonathan Ogden was the best lineman on the field, with all due respect to Jeff Mitchell, he still had to choose to submit to the line scheme calls of Jeff Mitchell. In terms of roles on the offensive line, Jeff Mitchell was the head. Jonathan Ogden could choose to ignore the call from the center, but this would negatively impact the whole team. Did this mean that Jonathan Ogden could not be creative in how he did his job? No. Could he decide which blocking technique to use and how to move defensive linemen once the play started? Sure. But he had to make those choices within the confines of the scheme called. By the way, Jeff Mitchell had to function under the headship of the quarterback. And by the way, the quarterback had to fun function under the headship of the, the coaches. Hopefully you get the idea. The concept, concept of headship in football is just a part of the game is not something that one person demands for themselves. It is assigned to individuals within the game by higher authorities and by the nature of the game itself. Once the play starts, the whole offensive line is in the trenches together, working for the same goal as equals, but each filling his role, battling it out against the opponent. Buddies on the battlefield, as my dad used to like to say. This is true of headship within the church as well. God instilling headship into the design of his creation is not meant to limit anyone. It is designed to allow his creation to function at its best. When individuals, men or women, fight against this design, it diminishes the effectiveness of it. Jonathan Ogden is in the Hall of Fame. I doubt he ever argued over wanting to be the scheme caller. He wanted to be the left tackle who could not be the scheme caller. I am certain there are going to be great honors bestowed on Christian women in heaven that will exceed those of many men. Their role in the headship plan of God does not minimize their effectiveness in the kingdom of God. Rather, it is designed to enhance it. What is my main takeaway from these verses? Headship is something designed by God that impacts us all. Within the church, men and women must submit themselves to the headship of the elders, and we all submit ourselves to the headship of the Godhead. God's design for church function says, the man is the head of a woman. And so he calls women to willingly submit to the men in their church, and if they are married, to their husbands. Doing this allows the team, the church, to function as it is designed to. I also want to say again that this is not about status. It is about design and function. If it, is, if it is about status, then the Bible would not emphasize so much the servant nature, the sacrificial requirement of godly headship. It is nothing like what the world imagines it to be. Summary statement number one. The biblical principle of headship must guide decisions made concerning women's roles within the church. I hope I made that case. The headship principle was forefront in our minds when we, as elders, discussed women's roles in our congregation. And it needs to be considered when studying other verses about this issue. From here, Paul continues his, his instruction on function and practices in the church community. He finishes chapter 11, giving exhortation and instruction about the Lord's Supper. He begins chapter 12, speaking about the use of spiritual gifts and demonstrates how the church body functions by giving the analogy of the human body, which has many parts and varied function, and which all work together to make the whole body work. 
Chapter 13 is the famous chapter on love. It is love for the Lord and for each other that allows the church to function effectively. And finally, we arrive at chapter 14, where Paul begins by spending time discussing the spiritual gift of tongues. We then arrive at 1 Corinthians 14, verses 26 to 35. Now, I'm only going to read chapter 26. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. What should we do then, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each one has a song, has a lesson, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation that all these things be done for the strengthening of the church. <clears throat> Paul then goes on to specifically address church practices for speaking in tongues and sharing and evaluating prophecy. Paul starts the section with the question, what should we do, brethren, which means the church, men and women, or in this translation, brothers and sisters? Paul then says, when you come together. And so what is described is happening within the congregation. He then lists what they were doing and says they should be doing it. They should be doing it for the strengthening of the church. As all participate in the exercise of gift, the church is built up. Again, Paul goes on to specifically address tongues and prophecies. If Paul ended there, I would interpret this as saying that both genders play a role in the public activity of the church. But Paul does not end there. Let's continue. Verses 34 and 35. The women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. Rather, let them be in submission, as in fact the law says. If they want to find out something, they should ask their husbands at home, because it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Whoa! Where did that come from? I've asked myself that question a lot in the last six months. This is hard. Is Paul saying that women must close their mouths upon entering the doors of a church and not utter a sound until they leave? The problem with interpreting these last verses in this way is that it clearly contradicts what Paul has written earlier in the letter. If you look back in chapter 11, verse 5, Paul clearly states that women were praying and prophesying. And in verse 26 in this section, he says that women have a public role to play in the functioning of the church. So where did verses 34 and 35 come from, and what do they mean? They cannot be ignored, so how do we deal with them given everything else we've said so far. In studying this section, I was pointed to a commentary on it by D.A. Carson, who coincidentally, Kyle mentioned in his message last week. Carson studied these verses and wrote this. 14 pages of small print font on just verses 34 and 35. In it, he addresses nine of the widely espoused interpretations of these two verses, and then he explains at length why he thinks one particular interpretation is best, acknowledging that it even has limitations. Having studied this section myself, I lean towards agreeing with Carson's view. I will try to summarize quickly what he says now. Given the verses that speak of female participation in public service, it does not make sense that, to say that Paul has now changed his mind and does not allow women to speak at all. So what's going on? First, we should view this discussion through the lens of headship. Whatever women do in the church, it must conform to the headship principle. And so anything that is done must not appear to infringe upon the male role in the headship principle. What Carson concludes, and what I tend to agree with, is that Paul included verses 34 and 35 not as a universal principle, but specifically to address evaluation of prophecy. It would be a violation of the headship principle for a woman to critique a word shared by a man during the public gathering of the church. Men could evaluate publicly the prophecy of other men in the public gathering, but women could not. Notice in verse 35 when Paul describes a woman speaking privately to her husband about what was shared in the church. He specifically says the thing prompting the conversation is a desire to find out about something. 
which, by the way, is the same Greek word as learn in verse 31 discussing prophecy. Those two underlying phrases are the same word in Greek. The woman is talking to her husband, asking him questions out of a desire to learn about a prophecy that was shared in church that day. It does not say she is singing at home or speaking in tongues at home or even prophesying at home, but she is talking to her husband about something that was shared in the congregation which prompted learning prophecy. Given all this, it seems most reasonable to me, that verses 34 and 35 are addressing the evaluation of prophecy that was shared within the whole congregation. Again, the purpose of this prohibition is the promoting of the headship principle. Having said all this, I trust it is clear that this section of Scripture is hard. The easy thing to do would be to say, well, in order to be safe, we should just restrict all speech For women in the church when we're gathered. After all, it says the women should be silent in the churches. I believe to take this route would be to ignore too many other parts of Scripture that say something different and would fly in the face of the principle that we hold dear, the freedom we have in Christ. Summary statement number two. The instruction for women to be silent in the church does not mean universal silence, that women may never speak while in church. But silence should occur at appropriate times with, uh, in, sorry, appropriate times consistent with the principle of headship. This is where I currently stand on my understanding of this section. I am open to discussion and further study. One thing I do know when it comes to the Bible, I still have a lot to learn. Take a deep breath. We have one more section of verses to deal with this morning. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. In this letter, Paul is giving Timothy instruction concerning the proper organization and functioning of the church. In chapter 2, Paul addresses the conduct of women in the church, and in verses 9 and 10, he addresses proper dress of women, and then verses 11 and 12 come. A woman must learn quietly with all submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. She must remain quiet. We don't have time to go into into it today, but it is important to at least note that Paul justifies the instruction of verses 11 and 12, these, with the creation account again in verses 13 and 14. This makes it clear that Paul's instruction on women here has nothing to do with the culture into which he was writing it. This is a creation principle. So what are verses 11 and 12 saying? Again, consider the principle of headship. It is clear in verse 11 that in the context of what is being taught, the woman woman is to be submissive. When the woman is to be silent, when is the woman to be silent according to the text? When it comes to teaching and authority within the congregation. Can women teach? Absolutely. The Bible is full of examples where women are teaching, but not in this case. What is this case? when the church is fully gathered for instruction from the Word of God. What do we, the elders of Ford Road Bible Chapel, gather from these verses? Now, I should point out, not everything I have shared today would reflect the thinking of all those in the elders group. But this we do agree on. Oops, sorry. Right there. Based on our understanding of Scripture as a whole, and this verse in particular... It will be men who teach from the pulpit of our church during the 11 o'clock hour like I am now. And the spiritual authority of the church, the elders, will be men. Beyond that, there are a variety of options about what freedoms we have within our church regarding women's roles. The letter that the elders produced was what we agreed on together. We have listened to your input. And this will shape the final version of the points in the letter. But that is as far as we intend to go. We hear the comments of the slippery slope. But we do not want to allow this perspective to keep us from moving higher in our practices if Scripture allows us to do it. Will other changes regarding this issue 
or any other issue or practice come in the future? Quite possibly, unless the Lord returns. I trust that those who bring those changes will be as diligent as our elders have been to study the scriptures together and move forward only with those changes they believe fall within the freedom we have in Christ to function as a church as directed by the Bible. That was a long sentence. Should I repeat it? (laughs) I think I will. I trust that those who bring those changes in the future, if they are to happen, will be as diligent as our current elders have been to study the scriptures together and to move forward only with those changes they believe will fall within the freedom we have in Christ to function as a church as directed by the Bible. Please continue this discussion with an open mind. A dependence on scripture, free from fear and reveling in the God-given freedom we have to consider together how we function as a body of Christians. I pray this message has laid the groundwork for our congregational meeting on this issue, and I look forward to that time together. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we do pause in your presence. Lord, I want to start by acknowledging that we are far from a complete understanding of you, and we are grateful for that, Lord. If we could understand everything about you, you would not be God. And Father, we recognize that Some of the things in the Bible are hard, but Lord, we don't want to be afraid of that. We trust that the Bible is your word to us, inerrant, and that it speaks to us about how we should live as human beings in this lost world, and it speaks to us as Christians as to how we should function as a church for you on this planet, encouraging each other and building each other up in our love for you. And then seeking how we may use our gifts for your glory and for your kingdom. Lord, I just pray that you would help this body of believers through this discussion. May it be profitable. May it be edifying. May it be encouraging. May there be no foothold given to Satan to create disunity. Help us to be unified through this. Lord, that you may be glorified. As Christians, we should be able to do hard things together. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would be able to work through this current issue that's facing our body together and in a way that's honoring to you. Lord, I thank you for your help in the preparation for this message, and I trust that if anything wasn't clear, questions will get answered and asked. And Lord, help our conversation moving forward to be honoring to you, to be civil, to be free of fear, to be honest. Uh, Lord, help us to listen to each other, And Lord, just to, again, move forward in a profitable way. Lord, I am so thankful for Jesus. Lord, we look forward to when he comes back. We look forward to being in heaven. Lord, we know that even then, I'm sure all our questions won't be answered, but we'll have a lot of time to figure out the answers. Lord, um, but until that day comes, just help us to honor you in all that we do and say and think. Give us wisdom. Give us boldness. Give us maturity. For your honor and glory, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. The meeting is dismissed.